Let's check out a live look at the NASDAQ building right here in Times Square across the street from our I-24 News studios. And uh, U.S. stocks building on Friday's momentum, closing sharply higher this Monday. The NASDAQ up 8% and a half, the Dow rising 1.7%, the S&P 500 up 1.4%. It's now the biggest two-day rally for the Dow since 2015. Joining me now is Dan McClory. He's the managing director and head of equity capital markets and head of China for Bowstead Securities. Daniel, always good to have you on the show. Welcome back. And uh, markets back in the green today, big gains. Is this the end of the correction? I don't think so. Um, <laughs> I think until we figure out the reason for the volatility, which everybody is blaming on a fear of inflation, but that's probably not the sole reason. I think until we figure out that reason, we're going to continue to see volatility. I think it's reassuring that, you know, NASDAQ is up on the year now and the Dow is almost. Uh, so that's good. But uh, expect some more volatility. We do expect more volatility, especially as you mentioned, we don't know what's going to happen uh, with, with interest rates. Uh, the Fed does still look very much set uh, to raise them. But you do have the head of the International Monetary Fund, uh, Christine Lagarde, saying that she doesn't think the sell-off is anything to worry about and that she sees uh, the losses as, as a welcome correction. Is this perhaps a, a positive? Could you see it as a way of um, getting things back in order, perhaps like, burning down uh, the bad brush for the new grass to spring up. It might be, uh, or it might just be a central banker speaking <laughs> and uh, trying to uh, assure that they can uh, resolve these things and they, they need markets to settle down. <laughs> Uh, never, 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 never. I mean, she's a very uh, accomplished executive and knows what she's doing. But I think the, the, the reassurance that she's attempting to project with those comments is, uh, is welcome. Uh, but I don't think it's as, uh, as simple as that as saying it was, it was necessary and now we've purged this and gotten it out of our system and, you know, we're going to live happily ever after. But what's the concern? Because we know that the economy is strong, unemployment is historically low, and, and it's because of the strong economy that uh, there's an uptick of inflation and that it'll spur the Fed to raise interest rates. So a good economy is what led to, to the sell-off. Um, do you see anything fundamentally wrong with the economy at this point? There's probably a couple areas to look at, but just to get back to your prior point, Michelle, I mean, there's something out there called the inflation illusion. And it really runs counter to thinking, you know, this, there's this um, run on stocks when there's a concern over inflation. But, you know, stocks represent the present value of future earnings of corporations. And so if there's inflation, those future earnings are going to be even greater. So that terminal value that you're building towards at some point in the future is, is, is going up. So, it, it, you know, it, it kind of runs against actual rational thinking uh, to, to pin and blame everything on inflation. Uh, but, but to your second question, if there's a couple of areas that I think we should look at. It's, it's number one, and it was just brought up in the earlier segment. Um, what is this budget deficit potentially going to look like? Is it another trillion dollars mm -hmm. uh, from this new budget? That's one thing. And then because Treasury yields have been creeping up, you know, they've gone up right. from about 2.6 to about 2.8 in a very short period of time. And that's such a barometer and such a gauge for so many other types of instruments. Um, I, I think that's an area of, uh, of uncertainty and an area of concern to begin with. Um, passing the budget, of course, is, is imperative. Uh, and then you've got health care looming out there that needs to be resolved, um, which is a major, major item in our uh, U.S. You know, GDP. Well, and, and, and to your point, um, used to be that equities were the only game in town, but with uh, interest rates rising, uh, that makes uh, the bond market very attractive again. Uh, speaking of inflation, uh, Dan, the CPI number, that's expected out uh, on Wednesday, February 14th. What do you think the Fed is looking out for? What number could trigger Fed action here? Well, we've gotten the most input from the Cleveland Fed. And they've talked about median CPI getting above 3.7, 3.8. And it was, it's about 3.6 right now. So it's right there in the crosshairs. And again, median being um, a slightly different way of assessing the index. It's not looking at absolute individual constituents, but it's kind of looking at the median increase there. So um, I think if median goes, goes to 3.8, um, you're probably going to see an increase. Dan, uh, the president laying out his infrastructure uh, strategy today. Uh, the plan is really to turn $200 billion 
in federal money into about one and a half trillion uh, for fixing America's infrastructure by leveraging uh, the local and state tax dollars and private investment. Or what do you make of this strategy? Well, I think it's uh, I think it's phenomenal. I think it's got almost biblical origins where, you know, you uh, feed, uh, you know, two loaves fed 2000 and how you're going to take that initial piece that that the 200 billion dollar piece and how it's going to just be the multiplication of the loaves. Um, the, the, the way that happens is with with new thinking. Um, if, if we're in the old government nanny state, you know, point of view, and the only way out is for the government to print money to make things happen, then yes, it's woefully inadequate. It is completely underfunded. Um, but that's not what President Trump is talking about. Uh, you know, the, he's talking about the public-private partnership, which isn't just words. Um, it's, it's actual pulling together of interests, and it's an alignment of different funding levels. Uh, I'll give you an example. You know, uh, about a decade ago out here in the Los Angeles area, we had a terrible earthquake. And instead of just giving out the contract to the low bidder or the median bidder, the contract was given to a private group that was put out on a cost and time deadline. And depending upon beating the time deadline, they were going to receive uh, tens of millions of dollars more for just building a simple freeway mm -hmm. overpass. Um, they, ex they, they announced to their workers that they were going to share these profits with them if they beat, it was a 60-day time frame, an incredible time frame. And they beat it handily, and the workers benefited, and the company benefited, right. and taxpayers benefited because that bridge came back and the freeway was open. So I, I think this is what we're going to hear from President Trump. The only answer is not to print more money in Washington. Uh, the answer is to align interests, and the only answer for local governments is not to say, how much are you going to give me? You know, it's, it's how much can we all pull together. Right. Uh, I would expect some very good progress. Yeah, I, I would agree. Certainly bringing uh, the private sector into play usually yields faster, more efficient uh, results. Uh, Dan, we know you're a big China expert. And as you know, the world's biggest mm. annual mass migration is currently underway in China. That's and true. that brings us to today's notable number. And that is three billion, an estimated three billion trips will be made for the Lunar New Year. And that includes trips by train, bus, car and airplane. Now, in China, the Lunar New Year is a time to return home and visit family. And for many, that means leaving Beijing and heading for the countryside. The train station in the capital has been packed all weekend with travelers. Lunar New Year celebrations get underway this Thursday. Uh, so, Dan, firstly, 2018 is uh, the year of the dog. Uh, fun fact that uh, President Trump is born under the zodiac sign of year of the dog. Don't know if you knew that. Uh, beyond this, mm -hmm. obviously, this is usually a huge economic boost, uh, the Lunar New Year. But now it's being felt beyond China. Tell us about that. Well, you know, it's traditionally, as you point out, been just a, a, a period of the, the, the most movement and migration. I mean, I think that number you gave, that's about three trips for every man, woman and child uh, in China on average. So so literally everyone from the migrant workers who populate the cities go back to the countryside uh, to visit friends. Factories shut down. Uh, GDP is affected. Um, it's quite a phenomenon. Um, one of the trends you're seeing this year is that some workers, in fact, are, are staying in the cities. Um, they're not all massive heading back uh, to the countryside. Uh, but I think that has also to do with President Xi and the government, and they've got some, some newfound priorities. They're talking about things like education. They're mm -hmm. talking things about poverty, uh, especially rural poverty. Um, they're talking about things like pollution. So with China's ascendancy to being more of a global player, they are talking and in some cases acting in a much more globally responsible way. And I think those three areas are areas that any westernized country has been talking about for decades. And, and now China is paying a lot of attention to it. As they should be. A Dan, happy year of the dog and happy Valentine's Day. Thanks for being Thanks. on the show. Dan McClory Thanks, from Valstead Securities. Nice to have you as always. All right. Come